Thank you, Chris. Wow, this has been already a great, great morning, and uh, I really appreciate the opportunity to share what I've been working on for the last couple of years. Um, I also want to give a shout out to, to Wake Forest and the Virginia Tech Wake Forest Center for Injury Biomechanics. You know, this place is really a mecca for the research in sports-related concussion, and so it's great to be here talking about the work that I'm doing um, related to this, uh, this brain injury stuff. I want to just tell you a little bit about my journey in getting to working on this issue. I started out my sort of inventor, problem-solving career working on solving a number of other problems. The first problem I tried to address right after college, I started working on how to uh, reduce medical errors related to doctors learning how to do surgery. So I built up surgical simulators, and you know, I'm very proud now that almost every major medical center in the world uses these simulators to train doctors in endoscopy and interventional radiology. Um, in a strange twist of things, that led to work on video game accessories to get kids off the couch and exercising while they play video games, trying to combat the problem of childhood obesity. So I was really getting into using sensors to do surgical simulation and then uh, trying to get kids physically active. And I started to gain some, some, some understanding of the way sensors worked. And that led me to working then on this issue of brain safety. And I just want to start, before I get into talking about what I'm doing, just talking about what the clinical issues are that we're talking about. Uh, a lot of people now talk about concussions. And concussions are a brain injury caused by you know, a bump to the head. Usually, they're temporary issues. They don't last a long time. Often a few days, you get over the headaches and the blurred vision types of effects of concussion. So that's sort of a basic unit of injury for these type of brain injury issues. Um, the issue that a lot of people are really worried about, particularly with children, is if you have a concussion and you take a second big hit to the head, you can get this second impact syndrome, which is almost always fatal. It's always catastrophic, and it happens when the brain swells from that second impact. Uh, if you get that impact while you still have a concussion that hasn't healed. And the other issue that uh, we heard a lot about with the NFL players and the lawsuit there is the more chronic effects of just years of repetitive head impacts. They don't even have to be at the level of a concussion impact, just getting lots of head impacts over years, the degenerative uh, brain diseases that happen, um, and that are, we're just starting to learn more and more about that. So that's really the issues that we're, that we're dealing with. I got into this because I was helping out a defense contractor just outside of Washington, D.C., that was developing an assessment tool for the military so that if there were a bomb that would go off, they could put this device in front of a soldier and figure out if they needed to be evacuated or if they could continue to fight. And so I was looking at, well, this would be great to put on the sidelines for football. And then I realized that we're so dependent on the self-reporting of symptoms, and the kids never say when they're hurt, that it doesn't matter how good the assessment tool is, the assessment tools won't work. And that's what got me thinking of what we really need is something that figures out which kids took the big hits, and then we know which, uh, we know which kids to assess. The second inspiration for me... Oh, oh my gosh! And you had to see this a couple of times. I mean, it's, it's hard to... It's hard to watch oh this. In fact, I don't, I don't want to watch it anymore. So, you know, there are crazy coaches out there. There are people who sort of live through, these, uh, through the children that they, that they coach. When I you know, had this idea of, of why don't we put a sensor on the kids' helmets, one of the first things I did was I got introduced to a, a youth football coach. So I asked him if he'd join me for a beer at, at a bar. So I go to this coach, and I'm like, what do you think? of this idea of, you know, we'll put the sensor on the kids' helmets, and you'll, you know, since they don't tell you what's going on. So the coach says, there's no bleeping idea, and there's no bleeping way that I'm going to put that sensor on the kids' helmet. What would happen if it was third down and two yards to go, and the kid's light comes on? And I'm waiting for him to say, ha ha, and it would be a joke, but he wasn't joking. He was, his ego was so tied up in winning 
that he would let that kid with a potential brain injury stay in there just so he could win that game. He's coaching eight-year-old tackle football. <laughs> Crazy. That, that's when I knew. I said, okay, I, I, I have to start this company. I have to take that decision out of that guy's hands and have it be mandatory. If, if a kid gets hit really hard, he has to be assessed. So you know, here's the problem. Most of the kids, and this is, the, the study will show, most of the kids won't tell you that they have symptoms. Either they don't know, but usually their egos are tied up. They don't want to be pulled out of the game. They love playing these games, football, hockey, lacrosse, these contact games. And the problem is, as we were talking before about the injury, types of injuries, a lot of the catastrophic injuries, the second impacts, happen when the kids are playing with these traumatic brain injuries that are unhealed. I think that number is actually really low. I think the pro one of the problems in this whole area of research is the diagnostics around concussions is, is still not very good, so I think a lot of people are just undiagnosed. I think that number is higher, but 39% is still very high for the number of catastrophic injuries that happen when players are playing with unhealed concussions. So one of the challenges when I started looking at doing this was figuring out where does this technology have to live? And, and who even plays football? I mean, of course, you, you think, well, it's the NFL. Those you know, these big guys, they play football. But if you really start looking at it, it's really the little kids that are playing. It's the 14 years old and younger, and it's guys like this guy who's a parent who goes out there, does what he can with his time. He's got a full-time job, and he just gets out there and coaches the kids. It's great. But it means that it puts some restrictions on the technology that needs to be developed. So, we need to identify the athletes that have experienced the big hits, but the technology has to be super duper easy, beyond easy to use. It, you can't ask people to change their behavior, I don't think, to have technology be successful. You can't even have anyone required to turn the thing on. It just has to work. Uh, you can't, if you expect someone to charge the battery on this thing, forget it. The kids aren't going to charge the battery. The parents are struggling even to get out there to coach. That's not going to work. It has to be super easy to install. And the, the alert needs to be really simple and ultimately has to be affordable. And this is a pretty difficult set of requirements, but I felt if we could do this, we would have something that could really work. So I teamed up with a buddy of mine who's an aerospace engineer and we put together an initial prototype just to look at feasibility. And it looked like, hey, you know, maybe we could do something like this. My, my, my friend who we started this with, he had a background in designing satellite systems where energy use is really important, so we figured out how to make it, the battery last a really long time. And then we built up a lab where we, we put sensors in crash test dummy, the center of gravity of the head there, and we put sensors on the outside of helmets, and we started smashing these helmets. And we realized there's a big challenge because what we're really interested in is the energy that's being delivered to the center of the head, and it's unethical to put sensors in the center of people's heads. So <laughs> we wanted to put the sensor in a, in a convenient location on the helmet. But if you look at, the, at what the physics looks like when you actually have an impact, the helmet has a really fast, high peak acceleration, really short acceleration. But in the center of the head, it's much smaller, maybe one-tenth and a lot longer of an energy. So we worked really hard over the past several years to figure out algorithms which would transform the energy that's delivered to the helmet to the center of gravity of the head. We also had to work on figuring out what energy is delivered based on the direction of the hit, because it turns out that helmets don't work the same when they're hit from the front or the side or from the back. So we had to figure out that and build that into an algorithm that would deliver the appropriate response to the hit. By the fall of 2012, we started testing the technology in the field with youth programs. We were looking for, you know, will this be accepted? Will the kids feel it's, it's lame to have this, this thing on the helmet? Or you know, would the thing even stick to the back of the helmet? We had tried different tapes, uh, adhesives. Would it interrupt the game flow? That's what a lot of the coaches, they don't care about this concussion. I mean, a lot of them do. Some of them don't. Um, but the big concern with a lot of the coaches is will this disrupt the flow of the game? Will all the kids be sitting on the bench with blinking lights on their helmets and no one's going to be able to play the game? So we really needed to work to try to keep the game flow working and, and make it work. By the spring of 2013, 
we had refined the technology to the point where we got the interest of the commissioner of the Arena Football League, which is a, a professional football league, kind of like a minor league to the NFL. He had been looking for a solution like this for a long time, and we were able to get the sensors on the preseason games in the spring of 2013. Um, at that point, I felt, you know, these, these prototypes become like children. And you, you, you just want that, that sensor to work, and you, you really pull for it. But one of the things that, that we've always done in terms of this, this group that I put together developing this technology is we try to be somewhat divorced from our emotions related to these prototypes. And when you just can't get it exactly right, we learn to eat our young and to develop, you know, just to, to go ahead and develop something and, and, and scrap it and start over when you have to. And at this point, in the spring of 2013, we felt we needed to take another step because we weren't quite there with a, a reliable enough sensor technology. So we developed a new technology, and in the fall of 2013, that's a typo, uh, we introduced our first commercial version of the sensor, which is right here on this helmet, and it just attaches its one ounce sensor, it attaches to the back of the helmet, it turns itself on when it detects motion, and when it takes a big hit, it'll turn on an alert. A bigger hit. It's on. One more. One more. You know it's got to be a big hit. No? Here we go. There we go. Yeah, applause, please. <laughs> so what we've achieved is you know, utterly simple to use sensor, attaches to the back of the helmet. It's the first sensor now to be adopted by a professional sport, the Arena Football League. This year, about 10,000 kids and, and adults who participate in, in football, hockey, and lacrosse be wearing these sensors. And we're really just getting started because the, that third issue that we talked about briefly was the, um, the chronic effects of, of long-term exposure to subconcussive impacts. Well, you know, every year about 1.5 billion head impacts are experienced by kids playing football in the United States. And what we're going to work to do is we're going to do for brains what pitch counting has done for kids' elbows. You know, in baseball, in 2007, Little League Baseball mandated uh, counting pitches to try to protect kids' elbows. So now a 10-year-old pitcher in Little League Baseball can only pitch 75 pitches a year, a day, and then they have to take a break. Right now, there's no limit to the number of head impacts that kids are allowed to be exposed to. So what we're introducing this year is a hit counter. And it's going to count the number of hits for the season. And it's going to count the number of hits that have been experienced in the past seven days. And we're working with the medical director of Pop Warner, which is uh, the largest youth football organization in the country. He's going to set a limit to say, hey, if a kid takes a certain number of hits in a week, they have to take a break. Even though they don't have any symptoms, we just want to try to intercept and, and prevent those metabolic processes that start to occur that could cause those uh, chronic uh, brain injury effects. So, some take-home points. One of the things that I try to do in working with this technology is to not think about invention so much, because I think when you start thinking about invention, your focus starts becoming the invention itself and not the problem you're trying to solve. So one of the things that I've been trying to do with this technology as we're developing it is think about the, be really laser focused on the problem. I'm trying to identify these kids that need to be assessed for a concussion. And in focusing on that, whenever I'd have cool ideas about what to add to the technology, I would think, is that really helping solve that problem? And if it didn't solve the problem, I'd take it out. Keep it really simple. Solve the problem, don't invent things. 
And I believe that one of the keys to success in this is to be willing to eat your young, to iterate. So in two years, we've gone through four different iterations of this technology, and I think that's part of the key of making the technology a success. Thank you very much.